feel a little inadequate after that. So summer is rapidly coming to a close. Our children are back in school this week, and most of our college young people have already headed out. We only have a few more weeks before Paul returns from his sabbatical, and I have four more Sundays before I go on vacation with my older daughter to Charleston. Isn't the summer fun, especially this summer? In the book of James, we're reminded that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. Though the seasons change, the love and care of God are constant. As we send our sons and daughters back to school, may we never lose sight of that. So I welcome all of you here today, those of you that are worshiping with us online or here in person. We're so glad to have you with us, and we believe that everyone needs a church home. So if you're visiting with us, let us know of your presence. We believe that a church home helps you when you are rejoicing and when you are um, mourning. So we like to be a part of people's lives, and I certainly want to meet you if you're here. So introduce yourself to me. I'll be around right after the service if I'm not moving grandchildren. So one of the, th one of the things I have, um, all our, my grandchildren are here today because um, our daughter-in-law and son just had twins last night. So Abby and James are here, and it's exciting for them to be here, but it's also exciting for them to know they have a new brother and sister. So officer nominations are starting. The boxes are out in the narthex along with the sheets of paper. If you have someone you'd like to suggest, you can either email us or you can fill out one of those forms and put it in the box. A new sermon series is coming in the fall on September 1 because that's when Paul gets back. That's profound for me. The name of this, this series is Living Right in a Wrong World. Good luck. Um, also, choir rehearsals start back this Wednesday, and I am to encourage you, if you have any desire to be a part of the choir, to please come to the rehearsals. Uh, Claire would really love to have some new faces as well as the old ones, so I hope that you can make that. Make a Difference Day has always been a highlight for our church. It speaks to who we are and what one of our core values is. So on Saturday, September 7th, we'll once again be partnering with Rise Against Hunger to make 40,000 plus meals, which always boggles my mind. We hope that you'll join us for any of the projects planned that day to help us make a difference. You can sign up online or in the narthex. There is a table in the narthex today. And I'm also, along with that, I want to speak a little bit about, uh, as I talk about making a difference, what a difference has been made here at Northwoods on our own property. We wanted to provide a little bit of a storm update on all the repairs. First of all, I want to thank all the children, I mean all the youth and adults, or Jim's over the hill gang as he affectionately calls them, who've come out and tirelessly worked as we cleaned out the damaged items in the ELCP building, and, in the, and they're now meeting in the youth building, and they're going to stay there until we can get their rooms painted. That's the next step that, of what we have to do for them. We accept we expect them to be back in that space very soon. The exception is that one of the classrooms where most of the water damage was sustained, they won't be able to use that for a bit. Before we sheetrock and get the room set up, we want to address the issues with the roof and to prevent it from ever reoccurring. There are other areas that still need work, such as sheetrock, painting, carpet replacement. The choir room and the chapel still need some work. The fellowship hall and uh, bathroom and the hallways, which if you've gone by, you've seen some of the sheetrock is off. We wanted to let you know a little bit that, that although the trees are all down and, and you see them piled along the side of the road, there's still a lot that needs to be done. We are about obtaining bids, and as you can imagine, that is a particularly long process. Once we have those, we can put together a scope of work to determine the best way to move forward. In the meantime, we continue to complete any work or repairs that we're able to do, and I say we, not including myself, we, meaning Jim and his, and his uh, friends, <laughs> um, and we'll do those things in-house. So thank you again for all the ways that you did step up and make a difference. We really appreciate it. Um, also, we have Nona Holly with us today. Nona Holly is, grew up with the church, would you, that be accurate? Yes. And she's come back here before, so many of you might know her better than me. I did know her mom, um, Jerry. She and I did a lot of work together when I was first in the ministry in this particular presbytery. So do welcome her after the service, and I know that you'll have um, a lot to learn from her message. 
So now let us stand and sing hymn 517, We Come as Guests Invited. No? What is it? that song better so I'm glad <laughs> I can always count on looking back at Todd going thank you um, so for our church one of the markers of the beginning of the fall program year is the blessing of the backpacks it's a right that helps our faith family bless our children and teachers as they return to school it's a reminder to both children and adults that God is with them wherever they go a school system that teaches children and helps them to be successful in learning requires a body of people with a lot of different gifts. We recognize the teachers and the administrators are an integral part of the success of our children. So as we bless our backpacks, we also recognize the success of our children depends on the dedication of those teachers. <laughs> That's Emma, she's ready to come up. So all the children and youth and teachers, anyone who has a backpack, come on up. You can put yourselves on the steps over here. Yes, I need, the, I need you guys because you're going to help with the crowd control, so come on over. <laughs> you're good. Okay. You're just the first one, that's all. Okay, you all are going to look out so they can see how good looking you all are. Come on, guys. These are mine <laughs> over here. Go over where they can see you. Whoops. Whoops. You okay? Got it? Got it. Done. Okay. I'm going to invite all of you to join me in the litany for the blessing of the backpacks. It'll be on the screen.
We bless you, teachers and children, because you are special to us and to Jesus, who said... We pray you experience a safe environment to grow physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually this year. We bless you, teachers and children, with our prayers for God's daily protection and provision. We bless you, teachers and children, with a heart for God, that no matter where you are or what you do, you will always remember that God is your ultimate source of strength. For these words of scripture and so many others, we bless you with all the promises of God written in the Bible. I'm going to pray a prayer and then at the end there'll be the response will be on the screen. Loving God be with all these individuals, students, teachers, administrators and help them as they begin a new year of learning, teaching, growing and serving our children and youth. May their minds and their pencils be sharp. May their lunches never be forgotten at home. And may their pink pearl erasers help them to remember that mistakes are okay. In fact, are the most important part of learning. God, thank you for the glue sticks and the homework folders and the laptops and crisp no notebooks waiting to be filled. Thank you for schools and libraries and teachers. And thank you for the gift of curiosity and for your wisdom that is all around. And now the last part. I think there's another. Yeah, here we go. We pray all of this in Jesus' name because you love and we love you and you believe in us. And all the young people are going to be giving, uh, given these uh, little key rings. They're going to put them on their backpacks, I hope, so that they will be reminded when they see this that they travel with our love and our support and our prayers all of this school year. There is a little, um, when they get back to their seats, there is a little, like, um, I don't know how to explain it, like a little piece of plastic that you have to take off it. Um, you, you'll be fine. <laughs> you can do all the kids, okay? <laughs> All right, guys, thank you. Have a great school year. You can go back. Good morning, church family. Today we'll be seeing Glorious Days by Christine Sandfield. It's basically a story about all of us, how sometimes we find ourselves in a bad place, almost like we're in a tomb. But when we look to our good Lord and, and look to him and, and look for his guidance, that gets us out of that tomb and lets us live again. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you 
I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my doom Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day My sin was heavy, chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Amen I always got go up by the steps because I know you don't want to pick me up off the floor. <laughs> so I'm doing something a little bit different with our prayer today. It's inspired by the words of a poet, Mary Jane Oliver. She found inspiration for her work in nature. May we too find prayerful inspira inspiration in her influence and in the beauty all around us. Let us pray. God of glory, just as we delight in the new growth on the trees around us, May we delight over our own growth, our branches reaching to the sky, our children dancing beneath the summer sun, blades of grass between their toes. May we delight over the growth of our summer gardens, the food we can produce by seed and soil, the hunger we can feed with the abundance you, show free, you so freely share. Let us not be shrouded with concern, so overwhelmed by worry that we miss the ways that you grace us with delight. 
God of grace, help us to see your angels at work among us, lighting the way for the unhoused in the street, delivering cups of coffee, offering Ziplocs full of fresh toiletries and simple snacks. Help us to honor your angels with our praise and gratitude, the patient teacher, the loving parent, the determined firefighter, the volunteer rescue worker, the visitor of the elderly, the sick, the imprisoned. Give us eyes to see, O oh God, your angels at work and help us to be among their ranks. Just as the last roses of summer have opened their sweetness and are giving it back to the world, may we too concentrate on giving back out of our abundance. Loving God like the roses, what sweetness can we give back this week at work, at church, within our homes and our communities? Is it a smile or a supportive gesture? A longed for embrace? Guide us to share what we have to give, a kind, encouraging email, an unexpected compliment, a reassuring word of grace, our presence in the midst of pain, maybe a prayer of petition on behalf of the poor and the downhearted, an offering of time or treasure. Help us to be mindful of how we serve and share of ourselves. Generous God, guide us in our giving this week. Make us bearers of your abundant grace. In these final weeks of summer, we lift these prayers to you. You are deserving of all of our honor and praise. We pray for those who need our prayers this week, the hum homeless, the hungry, those whose homes have been ravaged by fires or storms, or those who live in violence through no fault of their own. God, also be present with those who are suffering loss or feel hopeless. Now, as the united body of Christ, Hear us as we pray the prayer that Christ taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Where two or three are gathered in my name, where two or three are gathered in my name. Sing the sweet refrain. There will I, there will I be also, and I will dwell with you, dwell with you always, and I will dwell with you, dwell with you, dwell with you. Thank you. 
two or three are gathered in my name. Good morning. It is a joy to be back at Northwoods where I was so shaped in my own faith and life growing up. It was lovely to be greeted with the words of holy, holy, holy. I will tell you that the first church I was called to out of seminary was in Cleveland and on their sign out front the week when I started, the first words were there, holy, 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 all the saints adore thee which was great, um, but the trick is always seeing if they'll put the same thing up on the sign after, you've le after you're leaving. <laughs> Let us pray as we prepare to hear God's word. Gracious and loving God, open our hearts, open our minds, clear away distractions and voices and to-do lists so that we might hear what it is you speak to each of us and to all of us this day. For we pray in Christ's name, amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from Acts chapter 11, the first 18 verses. Now the apostles and the brothers and sisters who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and then everything was pulled up again into heaven. And at that very moment, three men from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit had told them to go and to I'm sorry, the Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. Now these six brothers accompanied me and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and all your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had fallen upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I should hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced. 
and they praise God saying, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. May God bless this reading to our understanding. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, as the one who has prepared the word this day, I pray that whatever is from you would take root in the hearts that hear it. And whatever is not from you, let it be blown away as dust in the wind. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Have you ever noticed the variety of ways that people will eat? I remember a friend in Memphis, Missy. She was a kid who ate one thing at a time. So she'd eat her peas, she would turn her plate, she would eat her meat, she would turn her plate, eat her mashed potatoes, turn her plate, eat her peaches. Some people just don't like their foods to touch one another. Other folks love a good casserole or mm, what, Mexican food, something where every bite tastes good all together mixed up. And then of course there's that classic picky eater who has a preferred menu of chicken nuggets, macaroni and cheese, plain pasta with butter, and pizza. Nothing green, please. There are also purposeful eaters, folks who have given up eating meat out of their concern for the environment, or those who remove gluten or some other food from their diets due to allergy or autoimmune responses. In the first century, when our story from this morning takes place, the Jewish people, like many other cultures, were purposeful eaters. What they ate and didn't eat helped them to be defined as a community, helped them to know who was part of the tribe. Peter's vision came to him as the early Christian community was trying to define itself and its relationship to Judaism at the time. So for folks were a little bit more sensitive about dietary rules. When Peter arrives in town, there are some folks in Jerusalem who think that Jesus' followers are a subset of the Jewish tradition, a branch of the Jewish family tree. So they wanted to be clear that first, you needed to be a good and faithful Jew and then a follower of Jesus. So you needed to follow all of the Jewish laws, including being circumcised and following the dietary rules. Notice, this is primarily an argument about what men should be doing to be faithful. We are all, after all, products of our time. On the other side, there were folks who believe followers of Jesus are starting something new, separating from Judaism, so they no longer needed to follow the Jewish traditions and rules around diet and other laws. You can see why there was tension between those two, can't you? So into this context, Peter arrives having just shared a meal with Gentiles in a Gentile home. Gentile being what non-Jews were called. So a big no-no for the Jewish law first crowd. During the course of that evening meal though, the Spirit of God fills those in that family and they profess faith in Jesus and they're baptized. Big yes from the new group for Jesus, folks. So into this tension-filled debate, about what's new and what is right, who belongs and who doesn't, God gives Peter a vision, a weird dream about animals on a blanket coming down from heaven. And Peter hears God's voice inviting him to kill and eat from among those animals on the blanket, all of whom are forbidden to be eaten under Jewish law. So Peter says, no thank you, nothing unclean according to the law has ever entered my mouth, ever. And again, the voice comes from heaven saying, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. In other words, what God has said it is okay to eat, 
you shouldn't call unclean or impure or even more transformative. I know what the law says. I, God, am telling you something new. Three times this happens, and then everything is pulled up again into heaven. And in that moment, that very moment, three men arrive sent to speak to Peter. They've traveled from Caesarea, and the Spirit tells Peter not to look upon them any differently than he would anyone who is part of the group. There's no distinction between himself as a Jew and these men. Go with them. In other words, don't see them as different or unclean or impure. So in spite of the rules that would have kept him from associating with those folks or eating the food that they served him, Peter goes with them. He speaks to them about Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes upon this household so that all believed. As Peter says, God gave them the same gift he gave to us when we believed in Jesus Christ. So who was I to hinder God? So that's all pretty dramatic. Animals on a blanket descending from heaven accompanied by God's voice saying what is clean and what is pure. The appearance of the men from Caesarea in the very moment that the vision disappears. God didn't leave any time in between for Peter to get distracted or miss the connection between the vision and the visit. And Peter does hear God's intention that he go with these men and share with them the gospel of Jesus. And when he does, they receive the gift of the Spirit and come to faith. But for me, the most dramatic moment in this story, the most improbable and powerful piece of the plot, is that bit at the end of the passage. Those who were criticizing Peter for associating with the Gentiles, they listen to Peter's story. They hear his defense of his actions, his explanation, the story that tells us then they were silenced. They didn't er argue further. They didn't escalate their rejection of Peter. They don't label him or shame him or bully him back into alignment with their own views. They praise God, saying, then God has given even the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. They rejoice that others have experienced the redemption that they know in Jesus Christ. They come to understand that having people know Jesus is more important than having all the existing rules stand pat. Welcoming people into the community of Jesus' followers is the goal, not arguing about rules that will keep the community pure. Opening up and expanding the circle is what God is asking of them. So their hearts and their minds are changed, no longer fearful that what they've found will somehow be diluted or worried about keeping this treasure to themselves so that it stays pure. They now rejoice that others know Jesus as they know Jesus. This may be the most remarkable part of the whole story. Because we are people, and it seems we have always been people, who put so much energy into sorting out who is who, into making rules about who can draw near to Jesus and who is not worthy. But this story reminds us God will not be bound by the lines that we draw around ourselves. God's welcome is more inclusive than ours. God keeps giving us glimpses of the vision, trying to help us see and be those who rejoice when others experience God's grace and love. From the pages of Genesis, where Abraham is told that through his descendants, all nations will be blessed, to the story recorded by the gospel writers of Mark and Matthew of the Gentile woman, whose faithful testimony leads Jesus not only to heal her daughter, but also to come to understand that there is faith in God to be found beyond 
the borders of Israel, outside of the family of Israel. In each of these instances and more, God seems to be helping the people to open up their expectations about who will be included in God's reign. Even Peter had to rethink the traditions and practices that his ancestors had passed on to him. To welcome, as God does, is to be asked to stretch beyond our comfort zone, beyond what we know, beyond what we have experienced. It's to make space for the new thing that God is doing. So were the blanket to descend today, here, what do you suppose would be on it? What might God show to us and say, I need you to see this in a new way. I am showing you what is holy and what is good. That rule, that boundary, that division, it needs to come down. I, God, need you to move beyond it. Might it be the branches of Christ's church and all the divisions that we've drawn between them? Could God be asking us to do the hard work of reuniting with our brothers and sisters? Could it be the way we reverence scripture even as we use it to punish and exclude and judge? Might God be calling us to a more nuanced understanding of God's word? Is the church the community that maintains classical music, historic buildings, and a 15-minute message from the pastor in the sanctuary? Or is the church, the community of Jesus' followers, to rejoice that people are moved by the Spirit to worship, even if it's worship accompanied by amplifier screens and a cup of coffee, or worship through community and service that happens nowhere near a church building? Might the blanket come into view with the history of the Christian church from the very beginning just laid out upon it? And God's voice saying, look, see, repent, let go and move on. What if the heyday of the mainline Christian church in the United States, those yearned for days of full sanctuaries in the 1950s and 60s, was something that God wanted us to quit looking back toward so that we could be looking toward the church that God has for the future. And if we imagine the vision God sends speaks to us about the church in the world today, could the blanket bring our attention to younger generations? The leadership and the critique that they offer the church and the world? Might the vision given by God ask us to question how we invite them in? Gina Buckley Yeager, who is the Presbyterian Church's associate for youth and triennium, has said about this passage, that weird dream of Peter with the creepy animals on the blanket, I would choose that for sure. How Peter is led through the dream is very appropriate for the way young people take up space in our midst and the differences they bring. We do a lot of critiquing of their technology, but it's their community building that's happening with those devices. These animals are holy vessels of God who have landed in our midst. People are figuring it out that maybe God can use this technology. There's an ongoing conversation about screens and phones in church. It's anathema here and necessary there. The blanket drop today, can you imagine what might be sitting on it? A monitor, a cell phone. If this imagined vision, this bringing Peter's vision into the lives we're leading today, makes your gut clench a bit, stirs up some anger or some defensiveness, some confusion, or maybe one of these imaginings just makes your heart sing and leaves you feeling tearful and welcome and relieved. There's probably something there to examine, to spend some time with. 
For the vision God gave to Peter turned his world upside down. It reoriented his understanding of what it means to be faithful. It asked him to place himself in opposition to the powerful, the majority, the history of Judaism to that point. This was no rearranging the deck chairs or applying a fresh coat of paint. This was God's God's declaration that the way you've understood things till now is not the way going forward if you're journeying with me. As we seek to be faithful to God's vision, to be the ones who take the next steps in the history of God's church, let us remember that hearing and accepting and acting on God's vision leads the people of Jerusalem to rejoice and to praise God and indeed leads the church to be a place where each of us has been welcomed with God's spirit to strengthen and comfort and inspire us let us move toward God's vision with hope amen let us pray God of wisdom, God of all the ages, of our past, our present, and our future, your word can be demanding. At times it asks us to take such a look at ourselves that we want to turn away from what we see. At times it asks us to move in new directions that are unfamiliar and uncomfortable. And so, oh God, give us courage Give us wisdom, give us the joy and the energy of being part of a community moving ever towards your hope for all of your creation. We pray in Christ's name, amen. So I invite you to join in the affirmation of faith and when we say what we believe, we stand with conviction. Please stand and join in the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Please be seated. We come to that time in our service where we act upon our commitment as Jesus' followers, giving of ourselves, of our time, talent, and treasures with our morning offering.
starting to pick it all up now, right now. The bad news is don't go out that way. <laughs> As you go from this place, some of you into schools, some of you into places of work, some of you home, all the various places that you will find yourself this week. Sometimes the work of being Christ faithful followers is hard work. It can be challenging could be that you're on the right path if that's the case, if it's stirring something in you and causing you to do both some internal and some external work. As you do that work, know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit are yours today and every day to come. Amen. <laughs>